May I now also invite Mr. Ho to join His Excellency on the panel. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the question and answer session. Please use the microphones at the aisle and kindly introduce yourself and the organization you represent before your question. Please go ahead. Are there any questions from any members of the audience? Where's that? Yes, please. Uh, good, good afternoon, President and Mr. Ho. My, my name is Mano. I'm uh, I, uh, from Raffalicia Holdings, a media consultancy. Uh, I've been editing two newspapers in Singapore a long time and uh, following Philippines' developments with interest. And I have uh, great respect for the people of the Philippines. I mean, I have many friends, and even here, I, I have friends who work here and live here. Um, my, my question is that, uh, you know, in the 1960s, if you look at ASEAN, uh, at that time ASEAN was not formed, but loosely that region, Southeast Asia, I would say that uh, Philippines was considered the most developed country, you know, in Southeast Asia, and actually, Indonesia and so on are behind. Even Singapore was struggling, struggling to get along. Um, and today, of course, 50 years later, unfortunately, if you look around, I would, I would put Thailand and Malaysia, Singapore ahead of the Philippines in economic development in terms of per capita income or whatever. So yes, uh, you've gone through a rough time. The question now is, you mentioned quite a bit about people's power and so on and uh, revitalization of the Philippines, but I think the key question in a lot of people's minds is why is the Philippines lagging behind other countries in Southeast Asia in terms of getting itself on its feet and pushing ahead like one of the Asian tigers, you know, to develop itself. And of course, ultimately, we are talking about jobs and I think uh, why Filipinos go all over the world to seek jobs is because they say they can't get jobs at home. And uh, the negative side of that is that some of my friends here, they even say that during the Marcos era, whatever we say about the uh, misgivings about the Marcos era, they said during that time there was kind of a security of living, you know, and, and there, were, there were jobs, there was opportunity for business, even martial law helped in that sense. So I think the big question now is, can, can you, I mean, or will you, are you, I'm sure you are, but uh, can you, in the next few years, uh, achieve that turnaround for the Philippines? Let me just compose my thoughts, because you're asking from a period about half a century worth of uh, explanation. <laughs> Let me start out. Uh, you claim Marcus's tenure was good. No. How, how should we say it was good? He had an insurgency problem that was all but eliminated until his second term in 69. He had the birth of the Communist Party of the Philippines and um, its aligning, well, the birth also of the New People's Army, which is its military arm. These were people who were the remnants of the Hook Rebellion. Okay. They started out probably not more than 20 people. When Mr. Marcos left, there were 25,000 armed men in the New People's Army. They were already conducting photo opportunities of their ambuscades. And in that period in time, night vision devices were not that plentiful. They conducted an ambuscade for the benefit of a, a foreign media entity in broad daylight. So I, do, I wonder who the people you are talking who talk about security. Because even in terms of criminality, um, I will grant, Perhaps in the first two years of the martial law regime, crime dramatically dropped, or incidences of crime. How was that achieved? I am made to understand that everybody and anybody who ran afoul of the law, even those convicts who had already served their time and were trying to reform their ways, were sent to penal colonies. So you had this growth of tremendous penal colonies without benefit of any due process or any trial. So long as you had the record, there was a, you did a crime sometime previously, you were relegated to these penal colonies. Let's talk about the economy. Marcos had the theory of uh, emulating the Zaibatsus of Japan. Unfortunately, 
he, his version of it was called crony capitalism. And the only criteria was your um, ability to get close to the powers that be. So um, in one of the, um, the studies that I, I came across in, throughout the years, there was a book uh, written by a sociologist commenting about um, the conditions of farmers in banana plantations in, in the southern part of the Philippines. He had the sub-treaties <clears throat> that talked about sugar plantations that were being built there. So they built, if memory serves, we write about three uh, sugar plantations in an area that didn't have sugar cane planted to it. Okay. Our National Economic Development Agency, it is the Economic Planning Board, stated that uh, these three sugar mills, or centrals as we call them, will be obsolete in 20, excuse me, in 20 years, and in 20 years' time, they would not have had a return on investment. In effect, um, Neda was saying, this is an investment that the government shouldn't go into. So his crony capitalist friend secured government guarantees for the loans for a program or for a project that did not even um, have a satisfactory feasibility study. He set up the mills, he gets his kickback from the setup of the mills, the national government is straddled with debt. Now, the net effect is, and I'm having it uh, completely vetted, when Marcos assumed the second term, we had practically no foreign debt. By the time he left, when I say practically, it was the uh, closest data we have is 1974, the Marshall Law period, it's about 400 million, if I'm not mistaken, pesos. By the time he left, it was 25 billion. And at that time, he presided also over an economy that started out with a dollar peso exchange rate of a dollar for every probably four pesos. To eight, it became a dollar to eight pesos by the time of his second term. And by the time he left, it was 25 pesos to the dollar. So not to concentrate on Mr. Marcos, perhaps the main thesis that I would like to propose is wrong governance has led us to the situation where now, we once were preeminent or second place in so many categories, and to now, where uh, we are not. Um, may I just add, with the good governance and with the correct vision, we have so much potential in the country, used correctly, could have maintained us in that preeminent, preeminent position. But there was such contentment in being mere providers of raw products. There was um, a lack of conscience in terms of providing adequate educational opportunities for our citizens. And we are now reaping the end result of all of this misgovernance, to include the close to 10 years of my predecessor. And let me just give you some of her economic policies. In 2004, we had the presidential election. Okay. She was my, the irony, she was my professor in economics. No. <laughs> and our National Power Corporation was forced to, well, had to increase electricity power rates because of the changes in the costs of uh, of our generation. She decided, because it was an election year, to postpone the increase in electricity power rates, and that resulted in an additional 200 billion peso debt just for that singular year. That single decision is responsible for roughly, sorry, don't have my calculator, but it's 200 billion out of a trillion debt that has been passed on to me. So I submit, where, where does people power come in? We are hoping, the first, they gave me the mandate. Therefore, the policies that we want to implement have an opportunity to be done. Second part, they will not leave us as in EDSA. After EDSA, everybody went back to their lives. We are asking our citizenry, join us when we fight corruption. Be the monitors when there are roads that are constructed that are substandard. Join us when we look at um, various government functionaries who do not pass a lifestyle check, and so on and so forth. Be with us no? when we help put up the schools, when we vet the education process, when we seek whether or not the delivery of health services is present. So we have a next opportunity here, and may we invite our Singaporean friends to join us in this rebirth of our country. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> because... Um, just hold on a second. I, uh, some of you will have to realize that because we didn't have time to set up a digital feedback system with all the other audiences we have uh, watching this, so I've, we, we had some questions already asked before, and I'm summarizing some of them together to ask you one or two, and then I'll uh, take questions from the floor. I thought that one of the 
more interesting questions that have been asked and that I'm going to pose to you now is that I think it is undoubted to any, any observer of Philippine politics that your administration has been received with greater fervor and greater enthusiasm than, than much in the past. As you've said, there's a feeling that there's a new beginning in the Philippines. Um, and your own personal popularity, your own uh, reputation uh, for integrity is probably unmatched uh, since your own mother became, was president. That is all on the very positive side where people truly have, of course, very high expectations of your administration. And with high expectations comes problem. The specific question that had been asked was, your mother came to power on the backs of people power. You are also doing the same thing today. In her administration, much was achieved. Much was also not achieved because of systemic problems. Having watched that lesson, what lessons would you draw from that you would now choose to do differently or that you're cautioned against doing to ensure that this second chance of people power does not go wasted? Thank you. Very, very good question, Mr. Ro. Um, an uncle of mine quoting one of his professors said, whenever you feel you're intelligent, remember you're standing on the shoulders of those who came before you. <coughs> and, excuse me, and precisely because of that, we are, um, we are trying to not repeat certain of the issues that happened then. For instance, we came from a period of martial law. Our, our media suddenly found their freedoms. In Metro Manila, we had um, 28 newspapers, all competing for the most negative headline. Uh, <laughs> and that, no, I'm sorry, that was true. It took them until 1990 to realize that they had eroded the goodwill that was there. There is, I understand, after my time in the School of Economics, a uh, subset uh, that talks about um, kind of perceptions of people being self-fulfilling. Um, Meaning if people think that the economy is going to get better, it does get better, and the reverse is also true. So the main capital um, going into the post-Marcos era was people's expectations of that better times were ahead. And they did. No? Look at the cement industry in our country. There were two factories operating at the time of, the, of EDSA. Afterwards, all the mothballed plants were reopened they were operating on a 24-hour basis, three shifts, and we still had to import the cement that we needed. Prior to that, we were an exporting country. So there was that boom. And in so many other sectors, the Cebu Export Processing Zone, I was made to understand, was um, down to about 32 or so locators. And within about seven or eight months, it was 108 locators. So much so that they had to build a second export processing zone uh, to, to siphon off the need. So, what are we going to do different? We know. We've been there. We saw it. So even at this early stage, I appeal to our media. I'm sure it, your newspapers get to sell a lot if it's negative. But perhaps you can add some positive time to time because there is positive news happening. For instance, um, one of the last complaints I had with them, the government-owned and controlled corporations remitted in 2010 uh, the amount of about 9 billion pesos. And basically, because we cracked the whip on them, by 2000 and, uh, 2010's proceeds you know, became 29 billion pesos. Our economy didn't grow by over 300%. You know? So this has to be attributed to our insistence that they be act as stewards of the people's wealth and return to the people by way of the treasury the incomes that were earned by these government-owned controlled corporations. Um, I, it, there's so many things that are going through my mind, uh, and there's a difficulty to bring it all out at the same time. Let me just try and, and add some more. Um, the insistence, I guess the biggest factor is the insistence that we want to make every stakeholder really aware that of his stake in what we're trying to do and get him to be uh, the perpetual partner in that which we're attempting to do. Let me make that very, very clear. After EDSA, there were people who got fed up with the martial law regime, joined us, and for the most part, joined us in the last four days of the martial law regime, which is the days of EDSA. They felt after standing up to the tanks that they had did their part, and everybody proceeded to go their merry way. In this instance, you know, we had volunteers who were with us during the campaign, 
And one of the things that I did ask of them and they offered to me in return was, um, I, they phrased it better. We know the problems that you will be confronting. We don't expect you to, to change our situation from black to white the following day. We hope you will lead us in making the, the in-between, the grays lighter and lighter as we move on. And we promise to help you on each and every step of the way. Now, there is a, a concerted campaign by, by our opponents who number about 3% no, to really disparage me, besmirch me, bring me down, and so on and so forth. But in spite of all of their efforts, the people, as evidenced by the latest uh, surveys that were conducted, about 80%, no, which is already an increase from those that joined us during the campaign, which is 42% of total voters, 59% of those who actually voted, we now get an 80% trust and approval rating from them. 17% or so are undecided. 3% are, are those who will be against us no matter what we do. So we hope that people power translates no, directly into uh, the facilitation of good governance. And good governance in turn will increase the economy, increase opportunities for everybody, make each one an even stronger stakeholder in what we're trying to attempt. Now, I have a single six-year term, and by the time I finish, the dream is there is enough momentum that has been built up. Our people are so used to the right governance, are so used to a higher standard of living that they will elect into office the next person who will continue what we're trying to do now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, you first, and then the uh, behind Leitron, when you stand up. Yes, please. Um, good afternoon, Mr. President. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Audrin Navarro. I work as a, a market research consultant um, in Taylor Nelson um, software. So I'm an OFW for, for anyone who um, would be familiar with the term. Sir, I have a three-part question that I'm very curious to find out more on. Um, political reform is one of the things that is thrown around. It's, it's a very big word. It's a very big word thrown around in newspapers, and, and we see it all the time. And I mean, I follow Philippine news every day, and we see we see the big we see the big fish that you've been talking about. The big fish are slowly being caught. The corrupt officials with the big bloated contracts suddenly um, being identified and being trimmed down to its appropriate size. So, but I have a three-part question though about political reform. Specifically, one, is <coughs> it currently in your administration, is it more a focus of removing people who are not supposed to be there, or is it more of an institutionalized reform where are the systems changing and if they are, can you give us an example of a system change in, in any, any part, of, um, any part of, uh, of the government right now? And I suppose the third part is moving forward uh, more than just knowing who have we caught, how do we effectively measure the improvements in political systems? So, so sort of like what are our key KPIs, so to speak, our key performance indicators that we've done our job? Uh, that's all, thank you. Thank you for another good question. We're not wasting each other's time here. But, but I was just um, reminded that there is a time limit, so I have to compress my answers, and I apologize for the lengthy answers earlier. Let me give you the example right away. We, have, um, we are proposing the postponement of the elections in the autonomous region of Nasli Mindanao. When you look at statistics, you look for the nightmare statistics, you will find it all in the autonomous region of Nasli Mindanao. Infant mortality rates, maternal mortality rates, uh, dropout rates, um, lack of access to potable water, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, what are we, why are we asking for the postponement? The Constitution says synchronized elections. But for whatever reason, the elections in the autonomous region of Muslim Mindanao always occur a year after the midterm of the presidential elections. Okay. It gives rise to the, for the potential that the powers that be, being Malacanang, can concentrate on making their candidate win 
using the resources of the state in the autonomous region, and you have a leadership that does not have the mandate of the people who put them into office. We are asking for the postponement primarily to be able to synchronize it by 2013, put in, pe put in place people who will not be running in 2013, and by 2013 have everybody concentrating on their own individual campaigns, doing away with a, with, excuse me, with a phenomenon that is um, generating command votes. Okay, the command votes we feel led into the growth of the Ampatuan family, and eventually the Maguindanao massacre. So, what is the political reform there? Uh, if I were interested in my just my political career, you know, having a substantial number of votes that I can order, you know, to be uh, given to candidates of my choice, you know, it would be very difficult to just give it up. But since we are advocates for reform, we are advocates for change, we will precisely change how things have been, have, have been done in the past to ensure that such a situation that can create um, such wrong governance will no longer happen. Again, it can only exist if um, the national government suddenly decides you know, to, to foster the next replacement and in turn, the persons elected by mandate of Malacanang and not necessarily of the people will deliver the votes for the incumbent. So we will change that because right now they will have synchronized elections, synchronized campaigns, and everybody will have to fend for himself in that particular campaign. So um, performance, key performance indicators. Then when we say betterment of the lives, and therefore automatic. Is there a lowering of the infant mortality rates? Are there more access to potable water? Are there X number of teachers, uh, have they increased uh, school buildings? Um, has the per capita grown? Is the insurgency down? I can go on and on, but I've been saying that uh, there might be some other people who would like to ask questions. I hope I, got, I gave you the idea of what we're trying to do. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Whoa. Okay, please, please. The gentleman in the front and then followed by. Maybe because of the interest of time, could you ask the first question followed by yours and then the President can answer both of them together? Good afternoon, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm Kenneth Inosensho with uh, Ernst & Young in Singapore. My question is, uh, we are all aware of the uh, tremendous expectations in which you were elected, and I'd just like to ask, in the first eight or nine months of your administration, what grade would you give your administration, and what is your greatest achievement so far? Thank you. I'm uh, Red Mendoza. I'm a lecturer from Yen Polytechnic. And uh, my question is, besides the public par uh, private public partnership and selling of assets, what are the additional measures that your administration will adapt to increase government resources to build the very necessary infrastructure vis-a-vis -vis your promise not to increase taxes? Can you hold it first, President? Can I, <laughs> can I answer the last question first? Well, um, part of good governance, we think, and we've already demonstrated it, let me give you examples. Uh, first month, perhaps the first three weeks, the Department of Public Works and IOS discovered um, contracts that were supposed to fund projects that to rehabilitate various public infrastructure for Typhoon Andoy. The main point is, in the last two weeks of the previous administration, they negotiated these contracts. My secretary uh, doubted the validity of these contracts, had it rebidded. Rebidding it automatically saved us about um, 300 million, 300 plus million pesos of a 930, 940 contract. That generates revenue for us in the sense that we are not spending more than what we have to, to spend. And that goes across the board. Um, the DOTC currently is studying this project that entails building roll on roll of port 72 in number that allegedly were op overpriced by about 100 million each pesos when it, uh, and the total contract price for each one was 150 million. So the overprice was even more than the acquisition cost. They're still finishing that study. Again, you free portions of the budget. Uh, going back to the public Department of and highways, we are not content to just do the things that have been done because they've been done since time immemorial. 
you, you know that we have a lot of uh, roads that would have boundaries of uh, hillsides and mountains beside them. We are used to have a budget of 3 billion pesos for the protection of slopes. You know, we used to use a pro project, uh, process called chakri. It's chicken wire, you, you put cement on top of it as a means of protecting it. However, cement does not contract and expand together with the soil dependent on ambient temperature. So what we're replacing it with is local grown technology, it's a geotextile, it's called coco wire, it comes from coconut husks. Coconut husks, uh, the fibers are made into mats, mats and use grass to grow. Grass is what holds um, the ground. So net result, 3.3 billion previously, 500 million this year, we saved 2.5 billion, it can go to other revenue uh, sources. You were also um, imposing on both the customs and the BAR greater efficiencies. Um, there, is a, there is a phrase uh, that the accountants would use, but I escaped you in the po uh, present time, but talks of efficiency of the BAR. We, are, we used to be 18% in that particular category. We're now 12, well, we were 12%. I think we're now about 14%. What have we done? We filed um, the, both the BAR and customs alternating each week file cases against tax evaders and smugglers, thereby increasing the revenues that we generate. Now, how does that grow revenue? The very first case that we filed against an evader was for a person allegedly did not pay his taxes, declared no income for something like five years. And in the same time frame, he managed to buy himself without any income a Lamborghini supercar. Okay. So basically what I'm trying to say is, we had citizens who were brazen enough to believe that they were so far beyond or above the law that they could get away with anything. And you have the customs just filed recently somebody who, again, uh, neglected to pay the appropriate duties in 2006 and 2007, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot the other question. Was. That's okay, sir. We, uh, we have time only for one last uh, question, yeah. so would you like to ask that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, sir, I'm Jimmy, um, your three SMU student. Yeah, I think you mentioned a mechanism of succession for democracy in the Philippines has been in place. But I think look, looking at historically, mechanism for succession is due by the military supporting the people's power. So I'm not too sure if how could you go ahead with good governance if you have to, in a sense, you know, uh, factor in what the military thinks instead of what democracy really means, of, which is a civilian. So in your outlook, right, in, the next, in, in your term, how do you see civil and military relations for good governance then? How do I, I'm how sorry, do you how, civil do you military how do you see relations? civil military relations in, so that you can promote good governance? Because we do know that military is an impediment to democracy. In, in our system, the Constitution specifically mandates that the civilian authority is preeminent over the military at all times. And this is in direct response to when President Marcos had the military as his main partners. The military then were, were the elements in the bureaucracy. They were managers in so many government-owned and controlled corporations. Uh, in effect, um, and even judges, in particular in my dad's case. My dad was a civilian, he was tried by a military commission. So how do you get them to be a partner? Um, in the last elections in our country, there were uh, widespread fears that there would be manipulation in terms of the, of the counting, in terms of the canvas of the elections, the conduct of the elections, and that the military would play a part. Those are allegations that first started in 2004 during the last presidential elections. Certain members of the military met me and they asked me, they, they said that they would not be a party to this. And in turn, I asked them just to remain neutral. No. Let us, uh, let, don't, don't uh, allow your forces to be used against the people, but we are not asking you to take the, card, the entire set of problems for the people. So I think you have the same situation in Egypt you know, where the military took a very neutral stance and became that stabilizing factor that kept the opposing factions from each other. So, so long as the military recognizes that they exist for the service of the people and that their very existence is dependent on the people, then they will be a supportive mechanism rather than a hindrance to attaining full democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Can I ask one I'm question? sorry. We've. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sure we can, okay. this can go on for a long time because there's so many, perhaps there's so much interest. Perhaps you perhaps take, take the last one. one. Okay, um, please. Yes, so um, long as there are short I have questions. I question on behalf of the Filipino community here in SMU. Uh, yeah, my name is Guillaume de Pies. I'm actually a member of the SMU Barcada, which is here with us today. We are the Filipino community of SMU. Um, my question would be, um, to be honest, for most of us Filipinos studying here in Singapore, we are bonded to work here for at least three years. 
And since, um, <laughs> yes, since um, the career opportunities here in Singapore, to be honest, are quite um, spectacular compared to what's in the Philippines, most of us will probably be working here for maybe the foreseeable future. So my question is, uh, what do you believe we can do as members of the future international professional community? Uh, what can we do to help um, uh, assist in the de development of the Philippine economy, as well as um, uh, alleviating poverty back home? Because to be honest, remittances, as I understand, are still a big part of our economy. But is there anything else that we can do which is uh, probably more effective and more powerful uh, since we are um, so many people abroad today? Thank Your you. students, and it reminds me of what my father once told me. You know, knowledge, in a sense, knowledge is power. And he admonished me to ensure that I studied well because he said, today you might be famous, tomorrow you might be a husband. Today you may be rich, tomorrow you might be the poorest strat in the world. But once you have imbibed the knowledge, that's yours for life. So what am I trying to say? We're trying to empower our populace. No? We're trying to get them more and more opportunities. And you will have, you have knowledge uh, imparted by this uh, really good school. You will have opportunities of uh, working with various nationalities and multinational corporations and that. You will have greater access to the workings of the international economy. Then you will be taught lessons, both here and outside, that you can impart when you do come home to our countrymen who may not have had the same experience and thereby grow their knowledge base substantially. So besides the remittances, I think, the sharing of the skills, you know, the sharing of the, uh, of the experiences, the sharing of the knowledge is very, very important if we are to move faster than what, uh, what we're doing now. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have a very quick question. Just the last one. Last one. President Aquino is yes, very Mr. kind. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I'm very honored to be here and see you in person. Uh, actually, uh, I'm from Taiwan, and my name is Xi Mi. Uh, as a responsive government, would you like to respond to the recent decision by Taiwan government to lift restrictions on Philippine labor in Taiwan? And following that, I'm also interested to know, under one China policy, on the one China policy, how would you like to maintain a good relation with your good neighbor, Taiwan? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we thank them for the restrictions, uh, the lifting of the restrictions. I think uh, the MSRs we sent reiterated the fact that we re do recognize you as a good neighbor, that you have assisted us through quite a number of years, if not decades. We do not wish to, to tangle nor um, make problems for all any er, and all of our neighbors, but um, it does, uh, the situation between the one China policy does present its complications. We will be sending further delegates, uh, delegations to Taiwan. We will be precisely mapping out, um, how should I put it, terms of engagement. Okay. <laughs> so, that, um, so that we both uh, are factors in making each other grow and have a stable and peaceful and harmonious relationships. Okay, would you elaborate a little bit on the delegation? I'm sorry? <laughs> uh, about the delegation you'll be sending to Taiwan, would you elaborate a little on that? <laughs> um, actually, my emissary went home earlier than, than I. He's back in Manila. I think he will be in Taiwan by next week. Oh. And um, I think I, it, any pronouncement should be coming from him because he will be talking to his counterparts then. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have We're, I think we're all very extreme, we're extremely honored that with his very, very, very tight schedule, and President Aquino has to rush to go home, not least of all because during the reception that we had earlier, we all found out that there had been a, um, a very earthquake. severe earthquake, 8.9, uh, that hit offshore Japan, off the coast of Tokyo, and no. it is expected that a tsunami, hopefully of minor magnitude, will be going towards uh, the northern Philippines. So, of course, you can see this is all in a day's life for a president. I'd like to just close, perhaps on a slightly personal note. President, when I was uh, a journalist a uh, long time ago, I used to cover the Philippines. I used to cover, especially during the Marcos years. I had the honor of having interviewed your father during the times when he was in and out of right. prison, as you know. He was very depressed in those days. And of course, as we all know, he, he uh, died as a martyr for Philippine democracy. I think, if I think back of the times when I met him, he would hardly have expected 
that his wife <clears throat> and now his son would become what he had hoped to become. So you have an enormous burden, very high expectations, and it's certainly questionable as to whether in a short term of six years you can considerably change what has been established politics in the Philippines or not. But I think certainly on behalf of all of us here and, and the many thousands of people watching by live uh, webcast, we certainly wish you the best and we have every hope that you will achieve your goal. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. On behalf of the Singapore Management University, I would like to extend our gratitude to His Excellency for taking time off his busy schedule to be with us this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. I would now like to invite the members of the Philippine delegation to take their leave. <laughs>